So this uh, next segment is, it's, a, it's several presentations again, but we're going to start with, well, the, the general session is protecting families from extreme outcomes associated with parental alienation. We're going to start with the John Mast case, what we can learn from the John Mast tragedy. I'd like to introduce Kevin Hickey. He has been a practicing attorney licensed in Arkansas and the District of Columbia for over 22 years. The vast majority of his practice involves child custody and often severe parental alienation ca cases. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm thankful for this opportunity to talk about John and his case, and I do hope that by telling his story, uh, we can learn some lessons and uh, hopefully uh, use what happened to him to, uh, to help us in the future. Uh, the fact is that we can't cover John's case in 20 minutes. There's no way. It was a three-year divorce custody battle, and that's really the best phrase for it. Um, so what I'm going to do is do a brief kind of a 30,000-foot overview summary of his case and then I'm going to go back and highlight some of the important things or notable things that happened uh, that may be of benefit to you. Uh, John Mast was married to Rebecca Mast Brashear, and they had two children, a daughter, Ashira, who is now 11, and a son, Zane, who is now 9. They lived in Williston, North Dakota, which is where the divorce and the custody case would take place. In late 2017, John and Rebecca had an argument at a local restaurant there in Williston. Rebecca filed for a restraining order stating that John had physically abused her on the way out to the parking lot after they had had dinner. A hearing was held and Rebecca explained how John had physically abused her. John also testified and denied that entirely. John had obtained a video from the restaurant's parking lot surveillance camera uh, that showed the incident, but he was not able to play it at the hearing. The judge erred on the side of caution, as often happens in restraining order cases, and entered the restraining order. John didn't realize it, but at that point he was a target parent. Not long after this hearing, Rebecca fled with the children to Idaho to live with her parents. John immediately filed for divorce in January of 2018 and requested that his children be returned. A temporary hearing was held in May of 2018, and this time John was able to show that video from the parking lot. After viewing the video, the judge found, quote, it is clear that John did not assault Rebecca. Since Rebecca was not honest about what occurred at the restaurant, the court finds that Rebecca's testimony is not sufficient to find that John perpetrated the other acts of violence and uh, threats of violence that Rebecca had alleged. And the court at this temporary hearing awarded John custody of his children. Now that was in May of 2018. It took until August, I'm sorry, May of 2019, it took until August for that order to be entered by the judge. So months went by with no ruling. John, uh, by that time it had been nine months since John had seen his children because Rebecca was refusing uh, any kind of visitation. John got the court's order in August and he went to Idaho to get the children from school and bring them back to North Dakota. Rebecca began to blow up the phones to Idaho CPS and North Dakota CPS. Now she was alleging that John had sexually abused his children. She also said there was a detective in Idaho that had performed a forensic interview of a Shira and that she had disclosed a uh, sexual abuse. Based on these allegations, the children were taken from John by CPS and a juvenile case was opened in North Dakota. By that time, John had had his children a, a grand total of seven days. Now, when a juvenile case is opened, it trumps all other cases on custody. So if you have a divorce case going on that has custody or whatever, the juvenile case takes over and that's what that juvenile case will determine what happens with those children. So basically, John's order of custody is put on the back burner. The children went immediately into foster care for several weeks. 
CPS did not want to leave them in foster care much longer than that. And with sexual abuse allegations hanging over John's head, they went with the parent that didn't have anything filed against them, which was with Rebecca, and placed the children back with her. So what does she do? You can guess she immediately fled back to Idaho with them. The juvenile case would stay open for one year. It closed in August of 2019 with no findings of sexual abuse by John nor any abuse finding whatsoever. Of course, Rebecca had custody nearly that entire year with John only receiving supervised visitation beginning in June of 2019. He would receive supervised visitation until the final divorce hearing in May of 2020. We had the final hearing as scheduled in May of 2020. The judge did not render his ruling for another seven months until December of 2020. He ruled that the parents would share joint custody but the children would live primarily with Rebecca in Idaho. John, however, would now finally start getting unsupervised time with his children. John, being the father he is, in order to be closer to his children, moved from North Dakota to Lewiston, Idaho, so that he could be closer to them. Rebecca still refused to abide by the court's order regarding John's visitation. This went on for another two months, until she was finally told by her attorney and the judge, you better start complying. On October 5th, 2021, John was finally going to get his visitation. The visitation exchange would take place at a popular grocery store parking lot in Lewiston, Idaho. He arrived a bit early and a few minutes later observed Rebecca's vehicle pull into the parking lot and park. As he prepared the back seat of his vehicle, for the children to get in, he heard the words, hi, John, from behind him and turned around and did not see Rebecca, but saw her father, Jim Brashear, pointing a gun at him. He shot John once from the front, and as John ran for cover, shot him twice more in the back. And John died a short time later. Uh, I attended John's memorial and uh, had the incredible privilege to speak at that as well, as long as also with many other people. But whoever put the sentence at the end of his obituary uh, got it exactly right. He was a hero, a warrior, and most of all, a loving father. Now I wanna talk about some of the things that uh, were important in his case. And again, we can't cover everything. I think we may have a Q&A at the end if you wanna ask some questions and then after the movie that we show tomorrow night. The first is the psychosexual assessment. John underwent a psychosexual assessment in January of 2020, and uh, but we chose one of the top evaluators in the country to do that. This was an extensive evaluation. The conclusion was that John does not exhibit any of the psychological traits and or behaviors of a person that would sexually abuse either an adult or a child much less his own children. So if you have sexual abuse allegations in your case, make sure you find some, and you want to use a psychosexual assessment, make sure you find, find an evaluator that is experienced and is going to do a good job on the stand. John underwent a polygraph examination on October 12, 2018. He voluntarily submitted to that. He passed it with flying colors which included all of the questions asked him, that were asked of him about sexually abusing his children. He denied all of it, and there was no deception indicated. Amazingly, I think we all in this room know polygraph examinations are not admissible in court. Amazingly, this got admitted in John's trial. John's trial was spread over several days, and I was not in several months as well. I was not hired until a couple of months before the final portion of the custody part of his case. So I was not present when the polygraph examination was admitted. I can only guess that mom's attorney was either asleep at the wheel or this was spoken by a witness and never corrected. But regardless, it got in and the judge got to hear that he had passed his polygraph examination. Restraining orders filed by Rebecca 
Rebecca testified that she filed for no less than three restraining orders against John in Idaho. On cross-examination, I got her to admit that every one of them was denied or dismissed. We found out after John's death that she had filed for yet another restraining order on the day of John's death, just hours before he was get, supposed to get his children. That, of course, was also uh, denied. There was an ad litem appointed in the juvenile case. There was not one for the divorce case. But the ad litem in the juvenile case was very helpful in John's divorce case. She came to testify. She testified that it was suspect that the sexual abuse allegations were made after the children went with Rebecca to Idaho. She testified that she never found any corroborating evidence of sexual abuse by John. She referenced the polygraph examination as well and found him to be honest every time she spoke with him. She stated that he persistently tried to get his visitation with his children and that Rebecca persistently denied it. She also found that there had not been a single finding of sexual abuse against John nor any criminal charges filed. She testified in her conversations, this is amazing to me, but this was John. She testified that in her conversations with John, he never once said anything derogatory about Rebecca or that he wanted her removed from her children's lives, from their children's lives. However, she had serious concerns about Rebecca's credibility and uh, anytime she would talk with Rebecca, it immediately went into allegations of abuse by him or whatever. And she noticed that every time he would talk about it, or she would talk about it, the stories would get grander and more exaggerated. And she got to the point where she had no credibility for Rebecca. She also was convinced and told the judge she was convinced that Rebecca had been exposing the children to her negative beliefs and opinions about their father. The visitation center notes, if you have a chance to get visitation center notes in your case, you should. They can be a gold mine of information. The staff at visitation centers are supposed to take notes as to what they're observing and what they're hearing. I can tell you that the notes, the visitation center notes in John's case were the most thorough that I've ever seen. And I take cases all over the country, they were the most thorough that I've seen. He began his supervised visitation in summer of 2019, and the notes were clear that the children were happy, engaging with him. It was father and children, every visit that he had. Nothing out of the ordinary. Then in August of 2019, two very important things happened. First, the juvenile case was dismissed with no findings, which meant now that the case is going where? Back to the judge that had given John custody. Secondly, all state agencies in Idaho and North Dakota had determined there would be no further findings or investigations or proceedings against John Mast. He was cleared. Almost immediately to the week, the children's demeanor in their visits changed. They became hateful and hostile towards John and I want to read you just a sampling. These visitation notes were like this. I want to read you just a sampling of some of the things that the children said. They said that their mother had told them they did not have to engage with John at visitations and that he was a bad person. They had, quote, read the court papers and knew that John had called their mother a liar, that John acted like he was sorry, but that he really wasn't and that he will do it again. They never said what it was. That their grandmother, which is Rebecca's mother that she lives with, had told them John could not be trusted. John's daughter stated that she was going to do to John what he had done to her mother. Then she proceeded to kick and hit him during the visitation. They told him, it's none of your business where we go to school because you might try to stalk us. They discussed court dates and details about the divorce that they only could have gotten from Rebecca. And on cross-examination, I got her to admit that she had been talking about the case with the children. They told John that their mother said they did not have to talk to him if they didn't want to. Perhaps the most damning statement, and this may be the underlying 
thing to all of this. The most damning statement that I read in the visitation notes came from John's daughter, Ashira. She stated, she told John, she knows what her father did, she knows that her father did something bad to her because, quote, mom told us. They said, mom told us to get our feelings out on you because she doesn't like it when we take them out on her after our visits. They said that the Idaho judge is going to make you stay away and you need to stop saying that your home is our home too. This is not one visit or two visits. This is over several months, these things continuing to happen. Finally, John asked the children because he had a habit of bringing them gifts when he'd come to the visitations. He asked them if they were enjoying their gifts that he had given them. And the children told him that their grandmother said those would be, quote, donated to the trash, and they were thrown away. The counselor for the children, and I had numerous problems with the counselor in this case, and I'll highlight one or two of them. Uh, Rebecca chose the counselor, and the counselor was in Idaho. John and the ad litem testified about this as well. John persistently tried to get involved in the counseling sessions, and the counselor wouldn't allow him to do it. In going through her notes, I kept noticing that she referred to John wrongfully removing the children from school and taking them to North Dakota. So when she was on the stand, I asked her, what do you mean by wrongfully? And she said that was information that Rebecca had given her, that he had wrongfully taken the kids. I then got the order out, giving John temporary custody, and I showed it to her. And I said, have you ever seen this order? It gives John custody, and that's why he went to pick up his kids. There wasn't anything wrongful about it. And she said, no, she'd never seen that. I asked her if Rebecca had ever informed her of that, and she said no. So for months, she had been supporting this false belief in the children that their father had essentially abducted them from school. She even noted in one session that Zane told her it was, her father's, it was his father's fault that they were put into foster care because he went to Idaho and got them out of school. She noted that this was an extreme source of stress for both of the children. I asked her if she was now going to tell them the truth now that she's seen this order and knows what the true story is so she could help them relieve this, their stress that they've been under all these months. She advised me that she was not an investigator. I pressed with more questions and that's the best answer I ever got. So I took that as a no. The forensic interview. You'll recall that Rebecca told CPS there was a forensic interview of Ashira. We brought this detective that did the forensic interview into the hearing so that we could question him in front of the judge. When I cross-examined him, he admitted to several violations of forensic interview protocol, including interview, interviewing the child in a police interrogation room at the police station, also wearing his uniform, and also wearing his fire, firearm on his side. He also admitted, once he was shown, he denied it at first, but once I showed him the transcript of his interview, he finally admitted to several suggestive and leading questions that he had asked Ashira. We had two experts testify about the forensic interview uh, that was conducted by this detective, and both noted that those violations seriously impacted any reliability of the information you would get from this child. One of the experts even noted that what was disclosed by Shira wasn't even a sexual abuse disclosure. And that when the child was trying to explain and physically showing that her dad's hand was on the, her lower calf, the forensic interviewer kept trying to get her to move her hand to her upper thigh, more than once. And the expert noted that that was obviously totally inappropriate and, and suggestive. It should be noted that North Dakota officials performed, after this, a second and proper forensic interview of Ashira and Zane. This was the first time Zane had ever been forensically interviewed, and neither child made any disclosures of abuse. The thing here is, on forensic interviews, it's easy to assume, a lot of times they're police officers, a lot of times they're not, but it's easy to assume that they know what they're doing, that they're 
conducting this interview properly, that they're properly trained, they have the experience, et cetera, et cetera. You gotta make sure that they do. And you need an expert, if you're not real versed in forensic interviews, to look at these and examine them and show you if mistakes are being made. Because on the surface it can look like it's a totally proper interview, but many times it's not. Um, I'm on the board of the John Mast Foundation, and one of the things that we talk about is making visitation exchanges safer. Um, John took what seemed like very safe steps. He met in a public place where there would be cameras. He took uh, two siblings with him, one of which he asked to video the exchange so that there would be no allegations against him that he had done anything wrong during that exchange. And these all seem like good ideas, but the problem, and we've talked about this a lot, and we've been talking about it today, is proximity. When you put these parents together in the same place and there's been high conflict, it, it's like a cinder, you know, and it, it can, can create conflict, can create violence. And so one of the things we've talked about is doing a staggered exchange at a visitation center. The child or the parent with the children will show up first, drop the children off, and leave. And then 20 minutes later, however long, the other parent will come and pick up. That helps with keeping this, this uh, togetherness or being in the same place at the same time from happening. It's, it's at least one stop gap. We know that no system is 100% safe. I mean, it's just not. And we are always open to ideas and uh, we, we've been so fortunate to talk with people from all over the world. We've got a table outside. If you have ideas or things you're doing in your area of the world that you think would be helpful, we'd love to hear them. Come and talk to, them, talk, come and talk to us about it. Because this is a problem that we have to solve. Uh, violence and killings at visitation exchanges are at a catastrophic level. So that is all I have. And I don't know if I have time for questions. I have three minutes for questions if anybody has a question. Yes, Lynn. What happened to the children and what happened to the grandfather who shot John? I'm going to start with the second part first because it kind of limits what I can say. Uh, the, the man that shot John, Jim Brashear, is awaiting trial. His trial starts in Lewiston, Idaho, the week of August 21st. It's been continued, to, and he's in jail. He has a million dollar bond and has not made bond, so ever since the day this happened, he's been in jail awaiting trial. Um, the children are with their mother. Uh, they were taken for an interview by CPS within uh, some of John's families here, they may, may can help me, within a few days after this happened to make sure they did a safety protocol or whatever. Um, they were interviewed extensively for an hour and a half to two hours. And uh, I can, we don't know the results of that interview, but I can only assume they assessed that there was no safety problem in the house, and so they returned them to, to mom. And mom has not been arrested or otherwise tied to what happened. Yes. Did the children witness uh, the shooting? We don't know for sure. We don't think so. Uh, Rebecca showed up a few minutes after it happened in her father. You know, her father showed up in her car. She showed up in her parents' car okay. and had the children with her. We don't know if they were there when it happened or not. I'm just wondering, would it be um, a strategy to um, bring up charges against the mother for emotional abuse of these children? Because she obviously engaged in behaviors that caused the children to have behaviors that were negative towards the father. And anytime we see that, we kind of think, you know, there's some child emotional abuse. I mean, is that something that 
is a potential so that those children can be away from the person that is actually the abuser? Um, you know, there was a lot of conversation after John's death with his family as to what to do. And uh, safety was always number one in the conversation. And after what had happened, um, I think it's safe to say that the general consensus that was that we don't know what this woman's capable of. And if something was filed to try to take them at that time, uh, the worry was that she might try to harm the children and herself. And so we erred on the side of safety. Um, two, over two years has passed now, a wrongful death action, this is public knowledge, a wrongful death action has been filed against Rebecca by John's family and against her father. So that is ongoing. Um, but uh, it's something that's it's on the family's mind. They, and they have not seen the children either uh, this entire time. Catherine, is that you? Good. We are out of time then. Okay. Thank you.